So, I've reviewed a lot of stuff over the last 11 years. Though it's frustratingly not as much as others who've been at this either just as long or for even less time, the way I formatted my series to touch on as much as I can to put what I present in proper context doesn't exactly leave me the space to invest in doing more. But I feel that, for what I do, I overall put together some unique takes on the variety of things I like and cover in comparison to my contemporaries and peers. But that's once more why I don't regularly do list episodes. It takes a bit more time for me to have the material together to really validate it. But with this being the end of year 11 and having done a list episode of the worst things I've done, it's overdue time for a best list as well. The thing about web reviewers, though, is the grand majority of us are accent the negative people. Not to say everything is awful, but there's more to be said about why something is bad. It's more difficult to say what is good, as what makes something good should be obvious. At least, unless you're contrasting it against something terrible, where it's clear the producers of the bad didn't grasp that. No joke, while I went on forever with my worst things I reviewed list, since I started formulating it, I could have doubled its length. That's not as true for this top 10, where there's some more... ambiguous stuff in there. And as such, this is my top 10 favorite review series that I've made for this show. Like with the worst list, I'll count one series done over multiple parts as just reviewing that series, so that shortens things a lot. But I'm going to be less specific in my category limitations, so let's go. Number 10, Kamen Rider Dragon Knight. Yet yeah, a contrast with my worst of list where this series source scenario got featured, I have almost nothing but positive praise for its adaptation. Hell, its star Stephen Ford a few years ago encouraged people to pirate the series, as it's unlikely, at least at the time I record this, that it will ever see a proper home release. As yeah, Dragonite is a series that's very much like Gundam Seed. It zigs at every point where a predecessor series people are obsessed with zag to directly highlight and call out the problems and failings of the originator series. And overall presents a much better story about the personal costs of taking a devil's deal for personal power and to obtain your heart's desire. While Ryuki spent its time showing its protagonist being an incompetent idiot that hypocritically got people killed because he didn't want to harm anyone, Dragonite's protagonist, Kit Taylor, was on an actual character arc bringing him through the gambit of challenges to not only make him a hero, but why he would refuse the same devil's deal others fell prey to. That list including his originating counterpart, but refused to fall himself. Kid makes mistakes and trips up on his path, but they are for far more understandable reasons than his source counterpart Shinji, where when in similar situations, he would deliberately make the worst choice because it was easier and absolve him of responsibility without ever having to face consequences directly. Kit, though? There were no easy choices. The ones he made at best being informed by his mentorship and partnership with Len, so he had a better perspective on things as Kit actually listened and learned about the events he was dragged into, instead of asserting his own damaged and distorted views, which helped him to make better decisions than both his source counterpart and those he was fighting. I like the antagonists weren't necessarily bad people, but being deliberately misled to make the bad choices they did. It thus felt more natural instead of trying to assert the damaged Aesop that commoners are monsters because humans are monsters. They're not. Asserting that lie is caustic and corruptive, and distorts perspective on how true, real evil is born from sociopathic malice and a complete lack of care towards others. Viewing them as less of yourself and unworthy of your empathy and making any sort of excuse for why they are that way. Few of Ryuki's antagonists reflect this, a component to why that series was so terrible. Whereas give people an opportunity to get what they want more than anything, say it's exchange for something simple, but have that spiral out of control, that's how true evil festers even in good men. The temptation to get everything their hearts desire makes them take one step at a time down a very dark path, regardless of the character of those offering it. Dragon Knight reflects this with its story. Ryuki does not. It does not even try and barely pays lip service to it, as most of the people that were contracted were already bad people. And it asserts the belief that people are selfish, sociopathic assholes, incapable of empathy by default. The Dragon Knight directly calls this out by name, act and deed as being wrong, makes it all the better in my book, as the people making the show they themselves were in the camp that utterly despised Ryuki. Number 9. Dust in Elysian Tale. I love this game, and it's kind of unfortunate that more games in the same universe couldn't actually end up getting made by its developer, for varied reasons. 
Yeah, Dustin Elysian Tale is basically the only indie game I've done on my show, which pretty much makes sense. RPG video games are a large time investment to not just play, but also make. It's hard to see a lot of development studios on the indie path to things really make that time investment when they could get more out of less work, such as what happened with Five Nights at Freddy's or Among Us. Even Undertale had a lot of Kickstarter backing to it. And beyond that, a lot of indie RPGs are made out of something like RPG Maker, a program that puts everything into an old-school 8-bit world map that honestly is not as appealing as they try to make it out as, as I legitimately hate RPGs made in RPG Maker. Dust, though? It's small time, but man was this professionally made from the top down. Of all the indie games I've seen out there, Dust is among the most beautiful and engaging and fun with its story, setting and characters. And I'm happy that it keeps getting re-releases. Hell, I love it so much, when Limited Run Games, which makes physical copies of digital-only video games, partnered with Dust Makers for a physical release, I went and splurged on their special edition release of that, and it was so worth it. Though this is a review that the YouTuber audience for my show never saw, as the video for it came out in 2013 back when I was still getting into the proper swing of things with the reviewer gig. And while it didn't match the production order of things when I released it, as it was part of my then comments to my productions 8-video December, probably because ad revenue back then across video platforms was insanely higher in December than any other month. Seriously, it was twice that of any other month a decade ago. It was actually right before I got sick with pneumonia, which I was afflicted with for a full six months after, and left me with nothing to do but work on stuff as I was slowly suffocating from the damage it dealt my body. I was in recovery for that illness for a long time, a taking up until 2015 where I wasn't coughing in every third sentence, and even now my left lung is heavily damaged with scar tissue. It was honestly surprising I was even able to get this video done at the time. But of the craptastic quality of my earlier videos, it's one of the few I still like. Well, on that tangent, the reason it takes some web reviewers a long time to improve their production quality is we don't know what we're doing a lot of the time, or what supplies to get the result in better quality. Hell, I still have problems with my microphone to this day that required me to spend time re-recording some of these videos. And there wasn't any time... And there wasn't a pro... And there wasn't for a long time any guide to doing this, and most of us had to learn that on our own. Me? I couldn't significantly modify my room I lived in at my mom's place, nor in my room in the apartments I lived in. Thus, it's only been recently I've been able to get large amounts of foam padding up on the walls to reduce audio issues. It was only in 2014 that I actually got a decent quality mic to record voiceover with. It wasn't until 2017 that I realized I should use my voiceover mic to record in tandem with my camera, and in 2018, 19, and 20, I was experimenting with different ways to pad my mics to get better, cleaner audio out of it, on top of playing with more and more cleaning settings and changing volume control settings to get rid of background noise. Audio quality, more than anything, has been the biggest hindrance of my videos. I am very aware of that, and I hope to cut out anything problematic I still have left. And I am very aware of it still being a problem. Number 8. Digimon World 3 2014 was really where I felt I was finally hitting my stride, and it was a strong year overall. I looked at the great Ruriken films, talked about Kuga, experimented for a short time with short-form filler vids, killed my nemesis that was the Final Fantasy XIII trilogy, started the .hack GU reviews, got a actual job that let me upgrade my equipment, got my previous PC that lets me improve the quality of my output, and did a better review of Final Fantasy X than many others have done. Basically, 2014 was my year to put out a lot of good stuff, and one of the ways I started out that year was Digimon World 3. Yeah, contrasting Dust, this was among the first I worked on after I got pneumonia, and it shows in the video a lot where I'm struggling to speak or even lose my voice. I burned through so many lozenges just to avoid coughing on this one, and that Shadow Government Sanity Slippage montage ended up really not helping my health with that, nor did my time spent grinding through the game in the first place. Really, why I consider it one of my favorites is because I just got to vent about it, and point out some of why the game is just plain overrated. Yeah, I'm in the minority that prefers the dungeon-crawling exploits of Digimon World 2, but at least that game is easier to navigate. I think most people latched onto World 3, though, because it was in that vein of pseudo-MMO games that were starting to make waves at the time, and it did precede the later evolution systems that would become commonplace with the franchise's games. Not to mention it allowed you to travel with your whole team in the overworld. As a predecessor to the truly great Digimon games like the DS entries and Cyber Sleuth, 
alongside trying to make everything in the game matter for why there's a place for them, this is not bad at all. But the world is just too damn sparse for what's there, and you don't really have a good idea of how to get to a lot of the things you feel like you need to do to do everything. Like, if your game is so convoluted that even the guidebook for the game really can't tell you what to do, then it's a sign that you might have overdone it a bit. But hey, since most of the gripes I have with the game got resolved and weren't repeating follow-up games that took inspiration from its style of things to make the new standard, then it makes the game better by comparison as now those are the highlights of it and show where some minor tweaking was needed to bring out its great points. And in my case, I'm using a game shirt to get around the leveling rates so I can just focus on building an insane stat that would enable me to evolve stuff appropriately. Number 7. Garo. I like to think I might have helped build the fervor that was made for getting this series imported. Though if not, I'm just glad it got out regardless. Even though the Blu-ray for the first 13 episodes are now out of print thanks to Sentai Filmworks not getting the sales the company needs for half their library of content. And the reason why Sentai Filmworks hasn't imported more is because their live-action import division, Kraken Releasing, basically couldn't get enough sales to support licensing more of anything, and had half their properties ripped from them when the Criterion Collection got the rights to the Showa-era Godzilla movies. The awful thing about the Criterion release of those films after that, though, is the Criterion Collection did not include versions of the film that included their English dubs. And hey, I have no problems with watching something with subs, but the Criterion Collection's entire thing is about preserving media that has historical significance and not including the English dubs in that release, when Kraken and other companies that put those movies on DVD did retain those, it is a massive disservice for their efforts. Bit of a coincidence with regards to these reviews, the timing for I and fellow Tokusatsu reviewer Easy Rider synced up a few times for when we'd release videos on this franchise. Not always exactly, but they ended up being comparatively close to one another. Another review from 2014, this was part of me trying to choose a replacement for the prior Evil Dead videos for something to be in the Halloween spirit. Sadly, that review series ended up becoming defunct. More recently, I've joked about how every time someone asks me what happened to me reviewing Makai no Hana, it makes me push it back doing it even further. But honestly, after I decided to stop doing the Toku reviews entirely, I felt like it needed to be a clean split. The original Garo series is still a great, strong series. Koga's arc is really fun, Rei Fujita literally steals scenes he's in. The series just works. If I was still going to be doing Halloween-themed months for review, I'd want to continue doing Garo. But honestly, I don't like the anime series for the franchise, and I wasn't that big on the more recent content with Reflection. But honestly, I didn't get a chance to watch it when it aired in 2020, because I was busy literally working every day during the 2020 quarantine by that point. I was exhausted and really didn't have the time for it. Number 6, Power Rangers Zeo. I was able to release four reviews of Power Rangers series plus its movie, and in each one I was able to spotlight something different with the franchise and its changes over time. With Mighty Morphin Season 1, I spotlighted its overall rocky ground in starting, but how there were genuinely good ideas with what they were doing, and how to address adapting material they were given, which showed intelligent thought that, over time, allowed the series to grow beyond the parts of it that just didn't work. In Space, the first of the Power Rangers series I actually reviewed, reflected this growth and the storytelling changes that had taken place, with it mostly being a darker, more seriously toned PR series with the cast in a long war to save Earth and the people of the galaxy out in the depths of space that was an active, uphill battle throughout their conflict one they only barely won with a Hail Mary pass tied to the longer arcs of the characters. PRIS being indicative of the tone that actually gave the franchise its best years of content from a story and fan-loved perspective. Dino Charge, the last of the series I reviewed, flipped that, and how the franchise had devolved since 2011 into Drek by following just MMPR Season 1's example aka the example of the worst season of MMPR alone, with such taken verbatim by example of the ridiculousness of its tone and the outright irresponsibility and idiocy of its cast, reflective of how Power Ranger series since Samurai have largely failed to understand the source series they were given and reverting to worshipping just the original season without intellectually understanding what was good and what was bad with the original 
and not paying attention to any of the series after MMPR to grasp what worked for 12 out of 17 previous years. And this is apparently something that's still going on with the franchise in what seems to be a track record of outright disrespect for older material present in new entries of a franchise, not just this one. This isn't a situation like, say, Mobile Suit Gundam, where every AU timeline for that franchise turns a critical eye to legitimate flaws and failings of the original Universal Century Gundam timeline, as I discussed in my Super Robot Wars reviews. Oh, no, no, no. Dino Charge followed the same track record of the new series, following the patterns of what was bad about MMPR and prior PR seasons, and deliberately ridiculing or ignoring the elements that actually made them better than the sum of their parts. They bring back MMPR bad guys who had their stories ended, and then treat them like complete crap while not even bothering to contact the original actors. It's the only legacy series, or rather, revived legacy series, that's done that type of disrespect. The most recent example of this being when they brought back the villain Lord Zed, one of the premier bad guys of MMPR, who during the events of Power Rangers in Space was purified of evil and had a happy ending to him where he could not be revived as a bad guy. But now, in recent Power Rangers, he was back as a Halloween episode gag villain, which is made even worse by this being done after his original actor, Robert Axelrod, died due to a treatable complication from a spinal surgery that he didn't have the money to afford to fix, and his crowdfunding attempts went nowhere. And Zeo, in turn, was a reflection of the continuance of changes away from the flaws of MMPR that Samurai Onward's series just didn't understand, as it completed a journey for several characters that had been around since either the beginning or just damn near it, while also allowing other cast members to have tangible character stories as opposed to how the previous years had only been slaved to just one or two at a time. The fact everyone got a chance to shine was a tangible change from the prior years, and it just required a minor shift in paradigm with how stories had been executed. This was very important for the years to follow, and showed how at the time, the people who were making the show were always looking for ways to improve instead of repeating almost verbatim things they had screwed up the first time. And it wasn't through pushing the reset button either, but by continuing to build from a foundation of previous seasons. Something more recent material just has not done with the ways it executes its callbacks. I chose Zeo for this overall as, while I rate In Space as one of the best seasons, I honestly felt a stronger emotional attachment to how I executed the Zeo review. In particular, the tangent about the infamous Dear John letter episode that basically pissed the entire fandom of the franchise off for a romance storyline no one liked and would have preferred to forget, which only got shoved back to the forefront of canon in Ninja Steel when Ninja Steel's writers didn't understand that. Again, the problem with the Samurai Onward seasons is while they seem to mine the Ranger Wikis for continuity references and callbacks they think longtime fans would like, they have no personal understanding of the show or its audience to know what to actually do to bring it anywhere near its former quality. They have yet to produce a new show that would rate better than a 3 out of 10 in comparison. Hell, there have been so many bad seasons made in the last decade that it would require someone to entirely redraw a 1 to 10 ratings map, as now the worst season of the original 17 seasons, Jungle Fury, is now not even in the bottom 5 shows. But yeah, about that Dear John incident, I actually received a very long message about my rant against the Dear John letter, one that was thanking me for putting into words that person's deep, visceral loathing of that entire plot, as it had disrespected a former cast member that this individual, a woman who had been a fan in her youth, had taken to value, and their characterization had been ruined for years because of that one incident to them. The Tommy-Catherine relationship in Zeo, which was compounded later by Ninja Steel reviving it from the dead when everyone else connected to the show had known that it was deeply toxic to even touch, was one of the few downsides to that season, and a sign that while the show and its production quality had grown by leaps and bounds, that it still had things to learn. And they did that by not repeating that shit in anything until Saban brought the show back in the 2010s. But the loathing of that plotline also showed what the true merit of Zeo was the true final season of what had become the long story of people fighting the forces of evil. The following year would transition that group out, and the season after would conclude the continuing story that had begun with MMPR, 
but this were the final tales of the people who had started out in those years. And if you ignore what happened to them in Turbo, it set them out on a high of no longer truly struggling against their enemies, but far more able to hold their own and win against an entire empire to secure their home safety by throwing all of its invaders off-world. While not every effect and every story worked, it brought them into their own as truly responsible, capable heroes in their own right. And if you ignore the silliest elements of MMPR, it brought it to a proper closure. At least again, if they hadn't chosen to do anything the following year. Had the cast that would take focus in the middle of Turbo and in space instead come in at the beginning of that season, as the beginning of a more true divide, I honestly think things would have gone better than they did. Because this is where their story truly ended for fans of those years. An ending that had little in common with the lacking elements that MMPR began with. It's an important step towards what would make the post-MMPR years truly great, and a transitional one to the elements that made the show in general have the staying power that it had. Instead of just being a complete zombie of a franchise only kept around to sell toys, which is the state it is in now. Zombie Power Rangers as the franchise is now is not appealing to me, and I've not bothered with even engaging with the more recent seasons. Power Rangers died after RPM. All that shambling along now is a corpse where not even the people who worked on it now understand what the appeal to it once was. It's one of the few reasons I'm glad I stopped reviewing Toku shows, as now, I don't have to deal with this shit that others are more active in yelling at a wall about. At the very least, I don't have to worry about giving myself a seizure from watching the newer stuff, as bafflingly, even with Noam Keneal no longer being part of the music staff, they apparently have yet to fix the fucking music. Just, just let it die already. Number 5, Mega Man Battle Network 3. I am so happy I got to talk about this one. Even if this was one of the reviews that got pushed back a few years due to real-life messes causing delays, and even my cartridge failing making me transition the Battle Network reviews to being done primarily with emulators. Yeah, I had lots of problems actually getting this one out. From assorted delays tied to me getting full-time work, to moving houses and apartments, to physical disability with my hands, before eventually, eventually I got this one out, and I love how I did it. I got to talk about Anetta before I got to talk about Anetta. I got to gush about Lan and Mega Man's growth as characters. And a minor element of the story in its morality play that didn't age the best with respect to how technology works. I got to talk about the version bugs the Mega Man games have had since they started version splitting. And I got what I feel is one of my best visual gags with the beginning of my model kit fixation by showing how much I tend to geek out about Gundam Seed model kits and their mecha design. Something that hasn't exactly abated, considering the state of my set, and what I had to pick up for the Super Robot Wars reviews. What, making things is my relaxing hobby. Hell, the entire room I film stuff in now is basically just a display room for all of them. The Battle Network reviews and the related Rockman anime reviews overall have been something of a breath of fresh air the last few years for me to do, as either the games are considered the classics of the 2000s, but some not given as much attention due to the lack of re-release, or in regards to their anime, something that was heavily screwed over in imports. At this point with the reviews, I'm actually past the two-thirds mark on being done with this too, since I hope to spotlight the Star Force games in anime as well if I can. But we'll see how things go and take it from there. Number four. Remember the promises we made? When it snows, we've got a huge snowman to make. You and I have to keep playing. We told each other we would. We made a promise! <laughs> So, um, guess who has two thumbs and unintentionally made the Persona fandom really, really mad at them? This guy. To be fair, the length of the video just worked out that way that that scene was exactly placed at where I needed to end part four of the reviews on that game. That wasn't exactly deliberate, it was just how things fell. Hell, the first response I got back after that specific video released was someone telling me, YOU SON OF A BITCH! I admit I kind of deserved it as, let's face it, some of the most impactful ways to end in an episode, in both good and bad media, is to do so on someone important who the audience is emotionally invested in, flatlining. Do it well, do it terrible, regardless of execution, it gets people angry. But yeah, I had a lot of fun with Persona 4, both playing and reviewing it. 
I liked the Japanese high school simulator thing it was going for, as I'm not invested in a lot of series that have that kind of aesthetic going for them. At best, it's the Rail Deck series these days. And living the experience in the places Persona games set up, it's fun to revisit, not just for the place, but for the people and the wacky stuff they get up to, and the small variants in things you can do only once per lap differently, such as dating any of the individual best girls of the story that's helped to make the games... mostly timeless. It's even more hilarious when you see what the English cast gets up to on social media. Yuri Lowenthal and Aaron Fitzgerald have an occasion play-acted as Yosuke and Chie, both online and at conventions. And if you follow Amanda Win Lee, well, she personally ships Yukiko and Chie herself, and even boosted fan artists who have depicted that. Which just leans support for the Yu and Naoto Shiragane shippers out there, since two of the cast are resultantly taken. And honestly, I've never heard of anyone who deliberately goes out of their way to romance either Marise or Marie. Sidebar, I deliberately did not mention that Naoto's name is an intentional homage reference to Time Fire Naoto Takizawa and Tsukimaru Gal Silver Shirogane Ogami from the Sentai series Time Ranger and Gal Ranger respectively. I kind of figured it was obvious, considering Naoto's entire stage was regularly making references to Super Sentai through the lens of Persona's own in-universe Sentai team of the Feather Man. Sidebar, the SMP model kits of the Gal Ranger mecha are amazing. On top of that, this review has what I feel is one of my personal crowning moments of funny, with the filthy man horror montage set to Uptown Funk by Bruno Mars, showcasing all the potential romance options of Yu Narakami, and supported in its hilarity with clips from the anime adaptation. Using that song for the time I did frustratingly caused that specific video that had it to be demonetized, but I let it go, as at least the video wasn't outright blocked, as happens far too frequently to my liking. If a song for a montage gets flagged, but the rights owners are willing to share the monetization and otherwise let the video through, I let that crap go at this point. And I think my analysis of the cast was very on point in how I related most of the main cast members to my love of the Dot .hack franchise helped by five principal cast members of the series playing part in the voiceover for this game. And I haven't heard of anyone else doing as cohesive a look into Yu Narakami's character as I was able to cobble together by bringing the depiction of the character in the game's anime adaptation to be part of telling the story in the way I did. As that's kind of the frustrating thing of player insertion characters. They rarely seem to have character beyond what the player themselves invests into their perception of them. It's actually why it's really frustrating that Sentai Filmworks' license of that anime was actually revoked by Sony and Aniplex, simply because they want to keep the prices for series they own extremely unreasonably high. When I got my Blu-ray set of the series for review, it was actually very close to when the anime got taken from them. So it's unfortunate that people after that who didn't get on board it in time didn't get that chance. But on the bright side, Atlas has re-released the game onto Steam, so at least you get the chance to play the complete version of the story, for those who became engaged enough with the review to look it up. Or alternatively, got on Persona 5, since my review was timed exactly with that game's release. And I hope that those that dope in on that had a good time. Oh, and yes, expect me to finally review Persona 5 The Royal very soon. I wanted to give the game an appropriate window of time after its complete plus extra content release, to finally talk about it. As man, do I have an entire theme plan for that one that I'm working on. I'll give you all a hint, it's based very heavily on actor illusions which the game itself invokes. It's just disappointing that Persona 5's anime adaptation was not well done at all. No surprise, it was done by A1 Pictures who are not a good animation company. So when I review Royal, it won't be able to use it as a character compare contrast again as A1's adaptation didn't really put intelligent thought into it, and is rather inconsistent to it. Persona 4 The Animation, at least by comparison, while it shuffled up some of the events and compressed others, it did so to retain everything important about both the experience, the characters, and the storyline it was adapting. Number 3. Kamen Rider Double <laughs> No! I love this show so damn much. 
If that opening bit didn't give the tone for how I was handling my review of that series, well, nothing else would have. I put a lot into the reviews of Kamen Rider Double, which I hope is reflected in the literal years I spent trying to restore it and keep it up on YouTube. No joke, when I had to take hiatuses in 2018 and 2019 due to physical problems I was having, I spent large chunks of that time trying to restore them. I love this review. I love everything special I did for this review. I love the larger look into the nuances of Riku Sanjo as a writer I did between this review and the following one of Kyoujer later that same year. And I'm mostly happy with how Kamara Double Futo P.I. turned out more recently. For those who would ask, yes, I actually would be up for reviewing the double sequel anime. That was not made by Toei, so yes, it is still on the table. I will also happily do Kamara Memory of Heroes if someone would want to Patreon me for it. Bit of a spoiler for my thoughts on that game? I really dislike how Shotar and Philip get the reset button pushed on their characterization, and why Eiji doesn't have his core medals being because they suddenly disappeared is nonsense when one could just say he handed them over to Kogami to allow him to continue his research in exchange for financing Eiji's activities in trying to restore Ankh. That's a really simple way to write that. Though admittedly, it is better written than O's Resurrection. I have so, so many problems with O's Resurrection. But as what I consider my real gateway entry series to being engaged with the franchise, Comrade Decay doesn't really count for this, it's what I've been hoping to do right by the alerting and spotlighting the history of what came up to it. And again, I feel like I did a really good job of it and my analysis of the cast and the unfortunate misaddressment of how Shotaro Hidari is actually a hard-boiled character. Just not the stereotypical one where he's emotionally dead as a way to hide his personal fragility, which Humphrey Bogart made popular. There's merely one take on a hard-boiled character. It's actually amusing that the series One Piece, with the character of Senor Pink in the Dress Rosa arc, actually better understood what a hard-boiled character is. And Senor Pink is a gag character that went around dressed as a baby with pride because doing so was the only thing that made his brain-dead wife smile. You translate that back to Shotaro, and you see the parallels I pointed out that just because he does something comedic, or sometimes loses his cool, the events of his life have shaped him into a hard-boiled character long before the series began. It's just his brand of hard-boiled is one that doesn't pretend that something doesn't affect them. The dude has a will of iron when the chips are down, and that's really what matters, to have an unwavering conviction. The show's staff put their best feet forward with that entry, it's just unfortunate that such didn't always follow, as series more recently have more and more shown. Alongside Toy as a company pretty much being taken over by Nazi apologist assholes. Number 2. Super Robot Wars V There are only two things more precious to me that I was thankful to be able to review than Double. And a Super Robot Wars game? That's definitely up there. As I went into with the intro video for that review series, I love giant robots. But with the problems of anime companies being awful to web reviewers, well, it's obnoxious to run aground of them when talking about them. Super Robot Wars is the perfect venue, then, of talking about the great, and the not-so-great, and heavily misinformed parts of the genre. I'm actually thankful for how positively those videos went off. I was actually quite surprised that my essay on Gundam Seed was some of the most positively received stuff, considering the hate them that exists for that series and its sequel, to the point I had to preemptively block comments on that specific part of the reviews. To say nothing of how I got cross aged to finally click with people as being something other than misogynist fodder. I was even more amused by how I finally got people to realize that it's actually the Universal Century series that are the biggest trash fires of the Gundam franchise and end up undermining the Super Robot Wars games after V more often than not. And I feel like I was being amazing with the reference jokes and humor, between the cross-series illusion jokes, the internal fun of the content themselves, and hell, how I actually made my own next time on segments for the parts of the review series. Yeah, for those of you who didn't watch past the start of the credits, I did those. I really got invested in that, and they had their own jokes too. Hell, how I was dressed for those reviews was showing how inspired I was for it. That sweatshirt I wore for it is one patterned after the Celestial Being uniforms from Gundam 00 Season 2 and their movie. I actually forgot to show that within the review series itself. You can actually find them on Amazon for not that much. Even the chapter titles I did for each part were a deep cut reference, and I'm happy for those who got them. 
Chapter 1, Towards the Sea of Stars, was a Space Battleship Yamato episode title. Chapter 2, Parallel Rail Panic, alluded to the beginning of the multiverse plot, featuring parallel universes. Rail, as in rail lines, which references Mike Gein. And Panic, of course, a reference to Full Metal Panic. Chapter 3, Vicinity of Fallen Angels, references Angelis and Cross Age by name. Her nature of falling from her family's false heaven. Her musical ability as a character. And, of course, her Japanese actress Nana Mizuki's career, and how deeply Anj ties into her own preferred persona, and the history it also bears with Gundam Seed's development. Part 4, Shadows of Sin Successors of War, was alluding both to the introduction of the Black series of standard colored mecha, with Black Mike Gain and Stupid Hair's Hysterica, the actual sins of cast members introduced such as Amro Ray, Successors being part of addressing how some of the series are legacy stories of generational conflicts or juniors inheriting the struggles of their forebearers, and of course, the faction known as the Martian Successors coming into focus as an antagonist. Part 5, Beasts of Possibility, while coming off initially as the descriptive title of the Unicorn Gundams, was also referencing Neon Genesis Evangelion, as the full extended title was the Beast of Possibility that cries I at the heart of the world the latter once more being an Evangelion episode title to complete the paired homage. And the third beast, also referred to in this, in turn being Mazinger. Part 6, Battlefields of Conflicting Hearts, was referring to the character arcs of Kaname Chidori in reference to her plot with Sophia, and the larger plot of the latter full panic novels that started with Invisible Victory. Boninger links with the Dakar storyline, and Hathaway Noah considering his anti-Earth agent future. Part 7, Over the Rainbow, both references the famous Wizard of Oz, Somewhere Over the Rainbow line, as well as the carrier ship from a pivotal Evangelion episode. The Rebuild movies also referenced with the subtitle, You Can Not Go Home Again, done in the Rebuild movie style of titling to address Anj and Hilda's character stories that were given focus in that part of the game. The Wizard of Oz reference I made is also a multi-tiered reference as someone going over the rainbow has been used as a metaphor for traveling to another world, tied to how the route split at that time took us back to the AD dimension. And on top of that, it's tied into the plot of Embryo basically being a Wizard of Oz figure in that for all his fantastical power, he's nothing more than a fraud masquerading as something more. And on top of all that, was Shin Asuka's part in the story at that point, with him accepting his past sins from his wish for revenge because of him being unable to get the people that made home back. There was no home for him anymore. Basically, the second the phrase over the rainbow popped into my head to describe the larger story segment, it's like my mind exploded into the galaxy brain for it as they just all connected. Matt Black Bullet for Part 8 honestly was weaker in comparison, that actually being the theme for V's protagonist stand-in, Soji's personal theme for when he's piloting the Van Gray's upgraded mech. But fit because Part 8 was where the Super Robot Wars original plot most centrally began to come into focus with everything. Part 9, likewise, is simpler, but considering the massive plotline climax with the revelation of Mazinger Zero, that simply declaring its name is Zero is all the more impactful considering its subtitle line, which itself was referencing both the actual title of Mazinger Zero, and also that of how Toma Kamijo's name reads as in the Raildex franchise, for his own power to literally reset everything twisted in the world. Oh, and it's not the last time I get to use that title either. I'm going to be able to get at least one more use out of it when I continue the Super Robot Wars reviews, considering Wing Zero, and the character of Lelouch Zero v. Britannia. Sidebar, why is Super Robot Wars mobile game that has some pilot swapping, such as with the Wing Zero Rebellion, not have Lelouch piloting a black and gold Mazinger Zero? A substory for that just writes itself. Part 10, though, was not one that worked out the way I intended. It was meant to reference a Gundam video game I really liked, also named Encounters in Space. But it's also the name of the original 0079 Gundam's third compilation movie. I had forgotten that at the time simply because, well, I utterly despise compilation movies because I have found time and again for them to do wrong by the series they are condensing the stories of. I was honestly struggling with names by this point, and it shows with that one. The title for the finale video, Part 11, 9's Missing Percent, 
was planned literally from the second I heard Nine's name and why she called herself System 99 instead of the ERS-100. And her finding what that missing percent of herself was became the tying storyline throughout the game for them. So what better title to conclude the review of the game on than one that encapsulated the entire journey everyone has been on? As you can probably tell, I did put a lot of thought into this one, both helped and not by the synopses of the series and my views on them. I'm happy most people who watched the vids came out of them with a positive experience, considering, yeah, I talked about just that game for 12 hours. And I'm going to be putting myself through all that again pretty soon. Fair warning for the Super Robot Wars X reviews, though. That game features Code Geass. I've been referencing that show a lot the last few years, and my perspective on that series ended up requiring such a long, abridged discussion that I had to spin off the entire piece on its own into its own separate video scripts, which is looking to be over four hours long on its own as it is. It is a lot, and I feel that video's response will end up subjective to whether people liked Code Geass R2 and the compilation films or not. Cause who oh boy was that a mess to deconstruct. And number one, my most favorite review series that I've done for my show. Okay, let's be honest, you all know what it is by this point. Dothack GU Rebirth Reminisce and Redemption is just that damn good, and I'm glad thanks to my own efforts in CyberConnect 2 getting the chance to re-release it, that it is more recognized for being it. My 15 video coverage on the game trilogy touched on everything significant, and ever since I found more charm points to it that only the truly foolish deny, or try to misrepresent. To be honest, I wish I had fixed more of my audio issues before I'd gotten to cover it, but when I did it, I felt like it was the best time to cover it. I actually revised the Reminisce review a lot, even filming a completely new set of live segments for it due to the nonsense that was happening around it socio-culturally at the time. Yet 2014, while I made a lot of good videos that year, was not a good year for the critics by and large, as it was when a lot of people started to lose touch with how criticism actually works, and under what circumstances something should be ridiculed. There needs to be an understanding by the critic of how to distinguish between when something is fundamentally wrong on an objective level with a piece of media, and when something shown is just a personal dislike or pet peeve. Making heroes that were previously anti-Nazi be pro-Nazi, or eating the plans of Nazis, is an objective problem with a bad story, and to an offensive detriment. Misrepresenting what and who a character is, is always wrong, and shows how little the makers of the media understood them. Making a new story in or rebooting a franchise in such a way that it makes it have nothing to do with the prior story, well, that's going to sway more with regards to what is done to it. Now, how far divorced it is from the original precepts, to the point you wonder why it's titled under the same franchise beyond name recognition. Now, I and others that are responsible critics make a point of distinguishing the two for these variety of reasons. There's a difference between this thing this person does is offensive and what this person does is offensive and that was the point of the person doing it as it was shown so a viewer correlates it to being bad and that can inform elements of the story and setting. Yet lately, there has been a whitewashing of that so both become the same and there has become an absolute loss of intelligent critique with regard to complex issues that are either strong-armed down people's throats in a way that makes people no longer open to what they're saying, or are not shown the respect they deserve and are turned into farces. But the hardships spotlighted in GU are not okay. It is never put in the terms that they are okay, but they are things real people go through and have to struggle with, and act as reflections of that with true understanding of the traits of those who have gone through that. And that's lost on a lot of people now, due to so much media not handling character appropriately. Having characters that experience those things makes them relatable and empathetic to an audience capable of understanding, and all the more a reason to call out those who make them go through it. Those struggles only become a bad thing 
when they are only done because a bad thing has happened and nothing is then done with it for there to be a point in that bad thing happening. If you kill a character just to kill a character, that can be a bad thing to do, as it can send the wrong message and present instead the idea that life is worthless, instead of the moral that life intrinsically has value and it is a waste to throw such away callously. You kill someone because it's part of a natural ending for that character to come to, and it's more palatable to see that happen. You have someone suffering depression be manipulated by someone claiming to be their safe haven from that pain, that's more relatable than someone constantly going, woe is me, with recognition that sometimes you have to be cruel to be kind. There is never edgelord nonsense for the sake of edgelord nonsense here, regardless of what Haseo's forms look like. It is instead part of larger arcs that seek to resolve their varied issues through interactions and camaraderie, to show people can be made better by coming together and working things out and wanting to be better for those around them, and embracing the truth of themselves instead of any lie that may make things easier for them. Why it's remained my favorite review, though, has to be due to how I've done the single most elaborate analysis of the cast, with the realization of the larger narrative arc it puts them through. Particularly Haseo and how his story is direct allegory for the five stages of loss and grief, and how someone overcomes that specific hardship with time. His own trip through it expressed at every step of his character arc, and being integral to the resolution of multiple plots of the series. How many have grieved? How many have suffered? You stepped on so many people just so that you could achieve your self-serving dream! No one has that right! Everybody grieves! Everybody suffers! Everybody has truths they want to ignore! You are not special! You're just like everyone else! Move on! It is sadly an arc that isn't as strongly addressed or tied into with Reconnection, the new content bonus scene part of .hack GU Last Recode, which, as I have said before, did not have GU's main head writer, Tatsuya Hamazaki, write it. And that difference explains everything about why that new content just feels off and ends up ultimately unnecessary. Have them kiss, damn it! Lewd handholding isn't enough for foreign audiences that don't understand what that's supposed to be symbolically acting as. More than that, it was personally the last part of me working through depression, which I had fallen into since 2008. But my original playing of GU had helped me to fight against with its own words on the matter. It's again why I feel it's such a personal review series. The right words at the right time made all the difference to me. Sometimes the best way to help someone isn't with comfort, but harsh words that wake them up from their delusions, both enforced and self-inflicted. Softer words and tone may engage some, but the ability to change one's approach to deal with real-world issues is important to resolving them, as no one strategy can address everything. If one doesn't, Try again until you find one that works. But most importantly, never let yourself stop getting back up again for the things that really matter. GU references and homages will no doubt remain a mainstay for my show for some time, just as it really should be. And that's my list, people. Whether you've only come on board recently or have been here since my first review of Onimushin 2011, thanks for sticking around. I've got a few more years in me out of doing this, so stay tuned for 2023's offerings. Though unfortunately, 2023 is not going to go off as planned. Due to unfortunate real-world constraints, I was not able to get what was originally planned for 2023 out the door. However, it has been prepared for 2024, and there will be no delays past that for its releases, as far as I can tell you at this point. 2023 will not be as sparse as 2022 was, however, you will be getting a full season out of me from that. And for those who are sticking around for that, thank you for doing so. I'm Dash Shinta, and thanks for coming on by.